Good morning. I am privileged, honored, blessed to be here today speaking. My name is Jean Marie Jobs, and if you're visiting, I'm an associate pastor here at Santa Rosa Christian Church. And I've been letting this message uh, rumble around in me for a few weeks now, which is kind of what I do to get prepared. And I am excited to bring it because I believe that God has a word for all of us this morning. And I think he wants to reframe or redefine the way that we have thought about love. And it's so perfect because it's Valentine's Day. So you're probably thinking about love or lack of love or whatever you are thinking about today. Um, but I believe God has a gift for us uh, in this message if, if we're willing to receive it. So Lord, I thank you for this morning. I thank you that your love, your loving kindness draws us towards repentance, Lord. That your heart for us, God, is that we would all come and be with you. Lord, release our minds today from assumptions, from preconceived ideas of how we should be or how you are, Lord. God, free us to receive you brand new in this moment. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm not going to click because it was bad last time. Thanks. Um, so this morning we're going to look at the passage in Luke, Luke 7, 37. And we're, as you may know, we're in a series about encounters with Jesus and how when people encounter Jesus all throughout the scripture, all kinds of stuff happen. Just like here and now, when you encounter Jesus, stuff happens, right? Their life takes on a different course or a different flavor. So let's look at this specific encounter. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, so she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who was touching him and what kind of woman she was. She's a sinner. And Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. And Jesus says this, two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii, the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back. So he forgave the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. And then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I came into your house and you did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, yet she poured perfume on my feet. And therefore I tell you that her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. And then Jesus said to this woman, your sins are forgiven. And the other guests began to say among themselves, who is this man who forgives sin? And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you, go in peace. This is such a fascinating story. As the more I looked at it, the more fascinated, the more captured I am by it. So if you look throughout the scripture, there are a couple of other instances of Jesus being anointed with oil. But not from anyone that is called a sinner. So this is a, this is a little different. So let's just set the stage this morning. I want you to think about the cultural context that this happened in. Okay, this happened in a certain, in a certain culture, in a certain context. And I think sometimes it's easy when we read these, uh, the scripture, we think 
oh yeah, I'm, I'm definitely that woman. I would totally do that. Yeah, this makes perfect sense to me. Of course. Because we have a revelation, a broader picture of who Jesus is for us than she had in that moment. And now you've got to also think about Jerusalem at this time. It was much like the Middle East is right now. Women were covered. Women were not allowed to uh, have a lot of contact with men. That was not, uh, not okay. It was actually pretty scandalous. As Dustin mentioned last week, people stayed away from women, men stayed away from women to avoid contamination. So this is the context, okay, of, this, of the culture right now. So Jesus accepts an invitation to dinner at the home of a Pharisee who clearly, based on verse 39, didn't even believe Jesus was who he said he was. So we know that. So then I'm wondering, well, why would he even invite Jesus to his house? Was he trying to show him up? Was he trying to trap him? Was he wanting to prove something? Why would he invite this man who had been preaching forgiveness of sins and all over to his house? Hmm. I thought, well, that's interesting. And now we have this woman. This woman, whoever she was, and I love that there's no name which is just interesting in itself. Um, but she had already obviously encountered Jesus at some point. So he had just been preaching and ministering. She had encountered him at some point, maybe in the last weeks, months, who knows. But she knew who he was. And she, for lack of a better word, stalked him. Right? She found out where he was having dinner and showed up. If you did that, that would be weird to someone. <laughs> Now, in that culture, it's even more uh, just abrupt and scandalous because, of course, she comes to the home of a Pharisee and shows up because Jesus is there. So fascinating. In any case, she shows up and does the unthinkable, the unconventional, the, the scandalous. And you really got to get your mind around how absolutely unacceptable this was. What she did was absolutely unthinkable, unacceptable. Just, just imagine what that might have been like. Now, here in our culture, if you had somebody just show up at your house and start washing one of your guests' feet that you were really excited to have for dinner that night, you would be a little like, this is different. But that person wouldn't have necessarily, maybe a pariah, Someone you wouldn't even be around, talk to, connect with, touch. And here she's wiping his feet with her tears, drying them with her hair. Wow. It's crazy. This scenario is crazy when you think about it. And then what happens next is even, <laughs> it's even more fascinating. The Pharisee, in the scripture says, the Pharisee, Simon the Pharisee, speaks to himself but then God answers him. Have you ever had that happen? I'm just mumbling to myself. I'm thinking something and, and God speaks back. You're like, oh, hey, you heard that, eh? So there he is. The Pharisee speaks to himself and he's saying, if this man were a prophet, prophet, he would know who's touching him and what kind of woman she is and she's a sinner and blah, blah, blah. And then Jesus says, I'm going to tell you a parable right now. Wow. And it's a parable about forgiveness. And it's a parable about great love. So just to get another picture, another piece of the context, you talk about the denarii. The denarius in that time was about a day's wages. So you have one person who owed a debt of 500 denarii, which would be the equivalent of about two years' worth of salary. And if you take out Sabbath and holy days, you got about... 500. That's a lot. Would that be a lot for any of us? The other guy, two and a half, roughly two and a half months worth. Still a lot. It's still a lot. Neither of them were small amounts by, any, by anybody's standard. So Jesus shares this parable about money and debt forgiveness and about how neither of these people had the means to even pay back what was owed. Hmm. That's interesting. 
So he essentially reprimands Simon in his own house, right there, in front of his guests and in front of this scandalous woman who's there. And then he turns back to the woman and acknowledges her great faith. Do you think Simon saw himself as somebody who had great faith? He was a Pharisee. That was his job. His job was to study the scriptures and know all about God and get it right and perfect the law. That was his job. So I imagine he thought that he had great faith. But Jesus didn't acknowledge his faith. He basically reprimanded him and turned to this woman, this messy situation happening here, and says, wow, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Hmm. Encounters with Jesus disrupt the status quo. They disrupt us, and they sometimes disrupt people around us as well. And I can't even imagine how messy and just scandalous this whole uncomfortable for people, oh, awkward, this whole scene was. And we don't know who this woman was. But we can speculate that she was known widely as a woman who lived a sinful life. So chances are probably pretty good she was a prostitute. That's a, that's a pretty safe bet in that culture. If you were known as a sinner, you had to do things pretty out there for people to see. And she also had this alabaster jar of perfume, which was expensive. So that's the other. How did she earn the money to buy something that expensive? Yeah, she was probably a prostitute. Now, it's so interesting to me. I think about this woman... And I think about maybe her as a little girl. And as a little girl, I'm sure that she wasn't thinking, wow, someday I'm going to grow up and be a prostitute. Probably not. Most of us don't recognize that it's the little choices all the way along the path that end us up somewhere. And I imagine it was no different, no different for her. So she has this perfume. Maybe it was the perfume she used for her customers. But if you think about it, this perfume, the investment of the perfume, the expense of the perfume in the jar, represented probably a lot of money. Maybe her savings, maybe everything she had. And so by her breaking it and, and pouring it on Jesus' feet, it was like saying, I trust you with everything. I trust you with my past. I trust you with my present. I trust you with my future. Everything I have right now, I give to you. Now, she could have hidden herself. She could have listened to him preaching, had this conviction of her sin, and then hidden herself in isolation, condemnation, guilt, right? That certainly seems so much easier. And we're all familiar with that at a lot of levels. But here, she, whatever happened for her in that moment of hearing him preach, that she would find him, track him down, follow him, show up where he was eating, even at the home of a Pharisee, and do what she did, is pretty staggering, really. It's pretty staggering. Her response to Jesus was lavish. It was generous. And if I would say, if we're going to be honest, we could say we're not always that generous with Jesus. We're a little stingy sometimes. All right? We drop a little in the offering. Oh, is church over yet? It's been an hour and a half. Oh. You know, we have, what, 105 hours of being awake generally a week. We spend an hour and a half here. It's just, we're just not quite that generous. But she was lavish. She was out of the box. Just, and his response, Jesus' response to her was so beautiful. It was so, you know, culture shattering, mind blowing, just also out of the box. He responded to her generosity and her lavishness 
in kind, right? The same way back. And her act was so personal and so intimate. I imagine people in the room were uncomfortable with it. Don't you think? I mean, that was intimate. I wonder what compelled this woman. I wonder what happened for her that she got there. And if you can receive this in that moment that she was willing to be there with Jesus, he redefined her. He redefined her. She was known as one thing, but Jesus now defined her as something completely different. Right? He did that. He, he gave forgiveness and in the process brought redemption. So as you all know, today is, of course, Valentine's Day. And as I was preparing for this message, it was, uh, God just does some interesting things sometimes with me. And I was preparing for this message. Last week, I started putting it pretty much together, and God reminded me that 33 years ago today, I was date raped by my boyfriend at the time. I was in college. And I had remembered what happened, but I forgot it was on Valentine's Day. So God brought that back last week. And I was like, why are you bringing that back? That's interesting. And he was like, oh, for this. Oh, great. Okay. Because 23 years ago today, I married John. And yeah, <laughs> it's, it's worth it. <laughs> and what God revealed to me, what he allowed me to see in that, is the truth that he is always redeeming. He is redeeming everything. He's even redeeming holidays and dates, right? He is the God that redeems. If we are willing to just put it out there, he'll redeem it. That's his heart for us. That was his heart for this woman. We encounter Jesus in our need, in our struggles, in our addiction, in our heartbreak, in our offenses, in everything. And when we do, we receive the adoption of the Father. And if we walk in the truth of that reality and of that identity, nothing can stop us. Not even death. Nothing. See, this woman trusted in the goodness of God. She trusted in his goodness. And he had not even been revealed as the Savior yet. Wow. And that trust transformed her life just by the willingness to encounter Jesus in that moment. It created this, this space. And what seemed inappropriate at this time was revelatory and revolutionary. And it brought forth something new. Imagine her courage to show up in the face of judgment and scorn and ridicule that she had probably been dealing with most of her life. She probably heard it all, had all the eye rolls, all the sneers, and yet she came. She came to encounter Jesus. She was compelled. So ask yourself, what is compelling me this morning? What am I compelled by? Is it the goodness of God? Is it the possibility of redemption? Is it intimacy with Jesus, the breath of his spirit? Can we be a community in a cynical world who, that trusts Jesus? Will we exercise the courage to live in the light with our depression and our addictions and our hurts and our betrayals and our struggles and our sin and our shame and our guilt and our mess? Because if we can't, we are doomed to hide our sins and hide ourselves from one another. And the scripture tells us that we get condemned because we love the dark. We condemn ourselves. God has nothing to do with it because we love the dark. What if we love the light today? 
What if we allowed Jesus to be who he says he is? Because listen, his blood is not going to cover what we won't uncover. Not because he's withholding, but because we're resisting. And we are magnificent resistors. <laughs> we, every one of us. And when we're living in that isolation and hiding, in that self-deception and denial, we sure don't have access to much forgiveness. We really don't. It's kind of like the Pharisee. Perhaps Jesus' message to Simon was, hey, the ability to spot sin in somebody else doesn't require or increase your love. Eugene Peterson says it this way in his book, Christ Plays in 10,000 Places. The Christian way does not eliminate sin in the community. Christians don't become sinless. Sorry, I know, bad news for some people. The only sane and biblical approach to sin is forgiveness. The sacrificial and operative center of which is Jesus Christ. Forgiveness moved by love. Sin confessed and forgiven frees us to develop relationship of love with the Lord and with other people. This woman with the alabaster jar, she allowed the revelation of her great sin to draw her courageously into an act of intimacy with Jesus. And his forgiveness was measured back to her the same way. I wondered, after I read this a few times, I wondered what did Simon the Pharisee's life look like after that moment? After that mess happened right there in his house? What did his life look like? Did he open his eyes? Did he see his great need? Did he see his own sin of self-righteousness and judgment? Or did he stay blind and isolated? And bitter. This woman, she is defined for all of history by her great faith, by her generosity towards Jesus. And listen, we are all defined by something. What is it that you want to be defined by today? Your life. Do you have a revelation this morning of how much you have been forgiven? How much you have been forgiven? Is there a keen sense of awareness of the grace that covers your life? And will you allow yourself to be, to be overcome, to be captured by the radicalness of God's deep and abiding love for you? Are you going to still try to do it on your own? Figure it out. Whatever you've done, or whatever you didn't do, it can be covered. What did this woman see that Simon the Pharisee didn't see? And what blinded him to the presence of the Savior in his midst? I don't know. But I'm sure it's something that we can all see ourselves in his space. Jesus told her three things. Your sins are forgiven. Your faith has saved you. And go in peace. And I don't think it's an accident, the order of his communication. I think it was very intentional. Because she saw and acknowledged her need and her love for him, he declared her sins were forgiven. Her history was now washed clean, all of it. And then he declared that her faith, which brought her there to that moment, opened up a new future for her. And then finally he sends her out in peace. I imagine that she did not know much of peace before that moment. I imagine with her life and the way people treated her that she did not know a lot of peace. Until that moment that Jesus released peace in her through that act of love and forgiveness. We don't know a lot of peace often in our culture either. 
We live in an anxious, anxious, anxiety-riven world right now, don't we? I mean, whew, the level of anxiety and stress people live in is, I don't know, maybe unprecedented. It's huge. What does it take to go in peace, to actually be in peace, to be with that peace? It has to start with our relationship with God. So the next time you're tempted to judge, allow yourself to wonder. Look at your own life and encounter Jesus here first. Encounter him here. If you can't encounter him here, you can't bring him anywhere. Encounter him where you're at. No one ever got closer to Jesus by pointing out other people's sins. No one. Ever. Not available. It doesn't happen. And I feel like Simon missed out by thinking somehow he could earn it. He could perform his way into it. If he, if he just did all of these things, then that would be enough. But somehow, Jesus disrupted this view of, of his love. And he says, look... My love is not something deserved. Just like your love for others is not something deserved. It's something that is released when you live in the reality of your unworthiness. When you live in that reality, when you're willing to live in that reality, then there is love that is released. Now that is not our definition of love. That sounds... So, ugh, I, I don't know. I don't like that. That doesn't feel good. I, wanted, I like to think I love people because they look nice and smell good and act the way they're supposed to. And, you know, all, all, my checklist. Come on, you got one, right? But see, God disrupts even our notion that we can perform our way into anything. And even the notion that we should expect other people to perform their way into anything. Wow. Sometimes Jesus disrupts our world. He disrupts the status quo. And sometimes when he does that, it disrupts people around us too. So this morning, maybe you're ready to hear from Jesus. Maybe in a new way. Maybe, maybe you need to know that your sins are forgiven. Or maybe you just need to know that you're a sinner. First. Well, my encouragement this morning is to follow this woman's example. To bring whatever's there into the light and seek forgiveness. And know that your faith can save you so that you can also go in peace. I'm going to ask the worship team to come back up. And as they play this, this song, I know the prayer teams will come up as well. I'm going to invite you, as they're playing, to just come before the Lord. Bring to him whatever it is you've been holding on to, hiding, condemning yourself for, avoiding, resisting, repackaging is something else, whatever you've done with it, just bring it, bring it the way it is before the Lord. Allow him to meet you because he wants to meet you. He wants you to know that you have actually been forgiven much so that your love can be much, that it can be released in the fullness that he's created you to release it. I bless you.